welcome to Governance Dialogues, uh, a program that I have the pleasure to host on a periodic uh, basis. My name is Elisa Cole, and I'm the Managing Director of Governance Center, which is a think tank and advisory firm that works to promote um, corporate and economic governance worldwide in collaboration with um, corporate and uh, public policy leaders. Uh, and in the last few months, for those of you who had a chance to tune into Governance Dialogues, we've had a chance to explore a number of topics in conversations, uh, fascinating conversations with thought leaders, philosophers, board members, CEOs, the likes of uh, Jacques Attali, David Beatty, um, Carson Bloch, uh, on a number of emerging topics in the post-COVID landscape, um, but also in the governance landscape um, more generally. And for today's episode, uh, we would like to explore uh, one particular topic and, and one that uh, we feel is, is very relevant at this time and age. And that is the world uh, of financial centers, in particular, uh, the role that governance plays in the rise um, and sometimes fall of um, financial centers, as it is indeed a very competitive uh, landscape. And to give you just a, a little bit of a background, the world of financial centers currently numbers around 100 um, entities um, that are active according to the uh, Global Financial Centers Index, with um, obviously markets um, such as the US, UK, uh, but also China, uh, and Japan uh, vying for top spaces, and, and that is a, a consequential um, being in the top space, is a consequential uh, effort uh, um, for, for a number of countries uh, with a number of expected consequences. And of course, it is a dynamic space. As we know, the Brexit negotiations are, are currently putting a lot of question marks around the future of London uh, as a leading global financial center. The rise of China, and particularly its um, active status in the in the equity market space, is also something of um, uh, noteworthy. Um, as well as the rise of financial centers in in new regions, such as well up and coming regions from a financial center perspective, which is uh, the Central Asia world, uh, where Astana has has become. Um, uh, much more active and there are a number of markets such as um, Uzbekistan which are looking to establish their own um, their own financial centers. So the question for today's uh, episode is, is uh, what role can governance play in the establishment and growth of financial centers um, worldwide and I couldn't think of a better person to invite to today's episode than the CEO uh, of one of the most active and the longest established financial center in the Middle East uh, the Dubai uh, Financial Center, which is one of two um, uh, centers in the UAE. Um, Brian Styworld is currently leading uh, the, uh, the efforts of, of the DFSA, which is the regulatory authority of uh, the DIFC, um, responsible for supervision of all of the entities um, um, housed in this financial center. Brian is joining us directly from uh, Dubai, and we'd like to welcome you to this episode of Governance Dialogues. Thank you very much, uh, Alyssa, and it's a pleasure to be here, and, uh, and congratulations on the, the Governance Center. I think this is a, a great initiative, and I look forward to our discussion this morning. Perfect. We will look forward to, to hosting you as well, and we have a number of questions that we, we, we are keen to ask, um, both in developments in Dubai, but also on your thoughts, uh, um, kind of on developments worldwide, as you know, your career has, has spanned Obviously, you've, you've been at the, in, in the DFSA for about 10 years, but you've also worked previously in the, um, in the U.S. Treasury Office of the Control of the Currency and, and uh, with helping the development of a number of markets, be that Poland or, or Cyprus or Ukraine or Kazakhstan. So we, we know that you have a wealth of uh, experience and, and, and thoughts uh, to share on, an, on a number of topics. But let me perhaps first start with, with where you sit currently uh, right now, which is Dubai, um, and focus a little bit on the DIFC and DFSA. Uh, and with that, I would like to ask um, the first question about what is your view of the role of this center in this rather fragmented uh, world of finance in the Middle East, where there are a number of centers, you know, one in Abu Dhabi, uh, one uh, coming up in Saudi, Bahrain, and a number of um, other neighboring countries. And what, in your view, differentiates the DIFC uh, and DFSA's regulatory regime, particularly from a governance perspective, from its peers in the region? Yeah, thank you, um, Alyssa. I mean, it's, uh, I think it's a remarkable development in the, in the DIFC, and that goes really to the vision of His Highness uh, Sheikh Mohammed bin Rashid Al Maktoum and, and, the, um, and the vision that he had uh, in bringing the financial center here 
um, uh, uh, to to grow the the overall economy and diversify. Uh, I think the revenue streams of, of Dubai and and this really in a very short 15 year history uh, I think um, uh, exemplifies the entrepreneurial spirit um, uh, of Dubai um, uh, and the resilience um, uh, of this great city. Um, uh, there's a number of things I think that differentiate uh, us or at least make us stand out um, uh, and. I'm not uh, very long on comparisons back and forth, um, um, but, uh, but what, what I can tell you about the DIFC and the DFSA um, uh, is that um, uh, the, the DIFC has grown over the 15 year period from, um, from just sand uh, uh, to now having uh, 2,500 companies, um, uh, plus or minus in the DIFC, um, uh, 25,000 employees um, uh, in the DIFC, and we have a, a regulatory responsibility in one way or another for about 700 of those 2,500 entities. Um, uh, we continue to grow. Um, uh, even through this year, um, uh, we've grown the number of firms uh, that are here. Um, uh, and our existing core firms are continuing uh, to, to grow and I think provide a valuable uh, resource to this region um, uh, in terms of infrastructure finance, in terms of wealth management, in terms of insurance, um, uh, were incredibly important um, uh, throughout the pandemic. Um, uh, that uh, the operational resilience of this center has been has been remarkable this year. Um, what separates us, the DFSA, I think, in many ways, uh, starts with our board of directors, um, and we have an incredibly strong board of directors who represent um, international regulators, international business, um, uh, but also. Uh, with a local uh, understanding of how business is done here um, uh, in, in Dubai and UAE and, and across the, uh, the region. Um, and from that board of directors, I mean, we, ha we have a, um, uh, a very strong uh, message of adherence to international standards. Um, uh, that The DIFC is, is based on those principles of adherence to the Basel IV principles, uh, IOSCO, IIS, uh, FATF, um, to name a few. Um, uh, and then from, from there, from the adherence to international standards, I think we, we bring a culture um, uh, in the DFSA with our workforce of understanding risk, of understanding business models. Um, and we continue to evolve with that because business models are evolving, um, uh, as you clearly see. Um, uh, so with that understanding, I think it brings a strength and a, and a level of confidence with our staff that we can communicate with the firms and communicate often. And not just in terms of you know, what the rule book says and what they should be doing, but in terms of, of business risk. Um, uh, and I think that's, that's incredibly uh, important. And I'm very proud um, uh, of our team uh, this year. I mean, this has been a, a remarkable year, um, uh, full of anxiety, full of change, uh, full of uncertainty. Um, uh, but the team spirit uh, here has, has really been uh, incredible. Um, uh, and I, I couldn't be prouder uh, of the organization. Yes, yeah, so I remember I, I've had a number of occasions to, to give presentations and it is in, in, quite, in fact quite a remarkable team you have. And it's interesting that you highlight also the role of governance um, at the regulatory level as a, as a key component of, of success going forward. But I would like to perhaps shift gears and, and, and talk a little bit of a about some of the more, um, let's say, um, painful pressure points in, in recent months and, and stories that we've seen emerge from the region uh, in the last few months, um, notably, of course, the Abrage, the NMC, and other cases, because let's face it, they galvanize attention. And we've been commenting quite widely, as you know, on, in Bloomberg FT and, and other sources on, on, on some of the risks and, and um, the consequences of, of those cases. And of course, I would like to ask you, what you what your thoughts are on, on the lessons learned, particularly in the Abraj case, where you were um, you, you you had a one year long, if I'm not mistaken, investigation, and you rendered two judgments on, on two separate uh, subsidiaries of Abraj that you had regulatory responsibilities for. Just your thoughts, if you if you if you have to share kind of some of the key lessons learned, and whether you think there are perhaps some salient list risks that have not been yet addressed in the private equity space. I often wonder because it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a relatively unregulated space if you look at compared to, let's say, banking or, or you know, um, other um, financial services uh, activities. So your thoughts on that, if I may. Yeah, I mean, I can, I can start with, with one line that I, I uh, Abraj is not a symbol, I think, for uh, the private equity uh, uh, industry. I mean, so the DIFC has a number of very strong private equity firms 
um, that are operating and, and have invested uh, a considerable uh, amount of time, energy, and resource um, uh, into uh, uh, developing and improving their control environments, uh, in particular um, uh, in, in the aftermath uh, of a barrage. And it's not an indictment of the, of the region, uh, really, either. I mean, this is one firm, um, and it boils down to, you know, in the most simple sense of a dominant CEO. Um, uh, and that uh, is a corporate governance lesson that, uh, that we should all take on. Um, uh, it's not easy um, to uh, deal with that particular problem um, uh, because corporate governance, as you, as you know better than anyone, um, uh, is not easily regulated um, uh, in that sense. It's not a set of rules that if you just comply with these 10 things that uh, you'll be successful and avoid any pitfalls. Um, uh, the, the corporate governance, in, in, in my opinion, corporate governance, uh, this oversimplifies the matter, but boils down to three words. Um, uh, and those words are could, should, and must. Right? <laughs> um, so when you, when you start with corporate governance, you start with the could uh, angle. And that, that's global best practice and how much you want uh, um, to devote to, to, to adhering to the uh, a best practice around, around the globe. And then you get into should, and should then uh, starts to rise in level of uh, um, some guiding principles that everyone uh, should follow. Um, you know, again, you have to base it on the nature, size, and complexity of the institution. But should really brings a level of responsibility that that you do expect firms um, uh, to to have. Uh, and then you move into the final category of must, uh, and this is where regulators have to step in. Um, that there are certain minimums that you expect from a corporate governance. Um, uh, standpoint with non-executive directors, with challenge at the, at the board, with, with the three lines of defense of any organization um, uh, that, that come with that. And that's where you can cite, you know, a non-compliant level, um, yeah. I guess. But, uh, um, uh, but you simply can't put everything under that must box because uh, firms are different, regions are different, um, uh, uh, et cetera. So there's, there's a number of lessons learned, I think, from, uh, from the Abraj uh, uh, scenario one, I think for us, um, uh, a much stronger emphasis on regulate on reputation risk um, uh, when we do risk assessments here. Um, uh, understanding the global picture um, uh, of any particular firm, um, uh, and particularly, I mean, within the DIFC, uh, we've taken a very active role um, uh, since uh, the abroad scenario uh, of looking at unauthorized activity uh, in the center, and that's where. Abraj got into its trouble um, more than anything was the, the entities that surrounded our regulatory entity, um, that they weren't regulated, they should have been regulated, um, uh, but they were not. Um, and, and for that too, uh, anytime that, that you have a global organization um, with no regulator above you, um, then you're gonna have to consider you might be holding the reputation um, uh, for the global entity. Um, uh, and so that's a key lesson learned for us uh, as well. Um, but I think it is important to, that, that Abraj was one firm, um, uh, one set of issues that were unique uh, to that firm uh, and not uh, representative of the private equity industry. Interesting. Now, I think that I, I definitely agree with your, with your comments on the role of the CEO. And, and there was actually, for those uh, who are interested, there was um, um, a Times um, magazine supplement that, that I contributed to that was called something like Taming the Unruly CEO. Uh, so it's, it's definitely not a topic that's just on my mind or on your mind, uh, and it's definitely not a topic that's unique to the Middle East, but it is an issue. I agree, and I, and I really like the could, should, or would to the point that I'm, I, you know, I would be willing to, <laughs> to reuse that with your permission in, in future cases. Sure. Definitely not everything can be regulated, and I have this um, conversation or struggle when, when, I talk, when we talk to regulators, you know, when we assist drafting regulations. I mean, you can't codify everything. Uh, otherwise, it, it just becomes uh, un, 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 applicable and unenforceable. But with the view of um, enforcement um, in mind, there is a question that I would like to ask that in particular on, on regulatory collaboration, because it, it is something that we've seen relevant not only in the Abraj case, but more recently in the NMC case, where you know essentially um, one could say that um, governance sort of fell between the cracks of being regulated by the London Stock Exchange and then, you know, the, the company being an Emirati company. So there was a presumption that there's some uh, further oversight, perhaps in the Emirates. And yet, you know, we've seen kind of egregious abuses again 
with the role of the CEO, but also auditors, banks. I mean, um, and for those of you who have been following, I mean, it's, it, it makes for a perfect corporate governance case study. But I, I know that you are very active as a co-chair of the Basel cons Consultative Group and observer of the, of the Basel Committee on ba Banking Supervision, and also with your breadth of experience before. I wonder if you have thoughts to share on on why companies are sort of falling through these regulatory cracks and what can, is, are there, are regulators aware of it or are they working towards better collaboration to prevent these type of um, cases uh, happening going forward? Yeah, I mean, those are, uh, I think, very good points you, you've raised. And, um, uh, and I'll start with the fact, I mean, the N NMC was not in the, uh, the, the DIFC. So um, my knowledge of, of NMC, I think, is, uh, comes from, a lot of the press that, that, that you and, and many of your uh, viewers have probably seen uh, as well. Um, and, and importantly, NMC was a hospital, uh, it wasn't a financial services company, and it was listed in the, in, in the UK. Um, uh, there are commonalities, I guess, um, uh, in terms of a dominant uh, um, individual um, uh, in an organization, uh, and whether that person had the right challenges um, uh, that, that should be present in, in any organization. And I think that's, that's one of the key uh, lessons learned from, from things that I've read. Um, but also from the audit industry, uh, I think, you know, again, in terms of those three lines of defense, where you have management, you have risk controls, risk management compliance, uh, and then you have uh, internal, external auditors that sit out in that third line of defense, um, that, uh, that I, I think there's been a number of lessons learned there. And, and I listened to um, uh, a few of the chairs um, over the past few weeks of the, of the, the, the big four um, uh, audit firms and some of the lessons they've learned. But I think just the level of professional skepticism that you have to bring um, uh, to, a, to an audit practice, I think is, is critical um, uh, of uh, not going through just a simple tick box exercise, um, uh, but challenging whether that exercise actually um, uh, is robust, uh, and that's one of the key lessons learned um, uh, there. And this goes around the the world. Mm -hmm. I mean, I, I, a wire card example is also uh, something that uh, there's a number of lessons learned uh, coming out of that uh, episode. Um, uh, that will be my interview later on today on on, on wire card with the, with the German corporate governance expert. So you're you're uh, <laughs> right on spot on, on that one. But there's another point that you're raising, which I think is interesting, and I, and, I, and I recognize that, again, not unique to the region, uh, is around the role of auditors and the role of banks. And if, I mean, I've read, obviously, through the Abraj uh, undertaking, so the decisions that you've rendered after one year of investigation in the Abraj case, and there were parts that were referred to basically money being moved out of bank accounts on around specific dates and, you know, in some ways, it seems, at least from an outsider point of view, I'm not privy to all of the investigation, of course, uh, that you've done, that it, in, it could have been detected, perhaps, uh, at the level of banks, um, these, these money flows um, when they were, they were going through. Again, as you say, auditors kind of, in many cases, in all of these cases, actually failed as gatekeepers. And I wonder if you have thoughts as to what might be the, the role of kind of regulators uh, overseeing kind of the, the audit industry? How is it going to evolve in, in the region, but also globally? And also banks from a perspective of, of this kind of monitoring um, um, perspective, not just as, as sort of bodies that lend cash to established uh, large corporates in the region, but really as entities that look at their client uh, cases and, and engage. Uh, and as in the NMC case, we saw that that now EDCB is paying quite a high price for, for, um, for, for, for that. Well, you know, and you would hope that there's some lessons learned there from, from the banks as lenders, um, uh, I guess, or investors, um, uh, if you want to bring into the private equity um, uh, space, um, that uh, um, when you lose a large amount of money, that crystallizes a lot of minds around, uh, let's not let this happen again. Um, so uh, I'm sure there's a lot of people in both of those instances, um, uh, Abraj and NMC, which are, are looking retrospectively uh, at what they could have done, should have done, um, uh, and what information that they had um, that uh, they didn't make uh, a full use of. Um, uh, so, uh, but also in a private equity realm, I guess, I mean, there, you know, when you compare those with banks, um, that the international standards and even best practice of supervision and regulation 
You know, they're not taking deposits. They don't have any access to a retail customer. Um, so all of their investors are professional and should be qualified to be professional um, uh, uh, investors um, uh, on that line. Doesn't mean that people don't make mistakes. Mistakes happen. Um, uh, but uh, uh, I am sure, um, and I can say this with 100% confidence, that there's a lot of lessons learned um, that uh, many people have, have had uh, along the way, including with the audit uh, industry uh, as a whole. Um, so uh, again, as, we, as I talked about that, um, part of our culture, I think, at the DFSA um, uh, is around understanding business models, understanding risk, um, and communication. Uh, communications is an incredibly important pillar, um, uh, even for us as a regulator, of, of how do we uh, interact with the industry, including the, the external audit uh, industry uh, on, the, on the risks that we're seeing um, and how we communicate. And some people call that the fourth line of defense, that we should be uh, interacting better um, between the regulatory um, uh, staff and and uh, the external mm -hmm. audit industry, no, it's it's true, and I I mean I know it because I'm subscribed to the DIFC alert, so I actually receive <laughs> I'm on the receiving end of all the communications. It is true that you're one of the more uh, vocal uh, uh, regulators in the region in terms of expectations and updates to to the regulatory mm -hmm. rulebook and whatnot. This this is. Um, mm -hmm. And in addition, I would say from the lessons learned, I mean, you know, the enforcement uh, uh, function of a regulator is also critically uh, important um, to act as a credible deterrent from, from this happening uh, again. Um, uh, so we've taken certain enforcement action. That's, that's been uh, well publicized. We're not nearly done. Um, uh, so we will follow this trail um, uh, to find the people who are responsible um, uh, and deal with those people as well. Interesting. Now there are there are, there are cases that um, that indeed are taking you know months if not years to unravel. So it, it's something definitely to follow. But I would like to perhaps shift um, gears from looking at what has happened to what might happen. And, and you know nobody has a crystal ball, but we live in this um, shifting landscape of, of risks, and we've explored it in a previous episode with, uh, for example, anti-corruption experts and others. And of course, COVID also presents um, perhaps new. Um, types of governance and compliance and, and fraud risks, let's face it, because, you know, everything is, is being shifted to in, um, virtual interactions and, and how effectively internal audit functions and uh, external audit functions and risk, uh, all those uh, lines of defense that you mentioned can function in this new um, ephemeral virtual world is, 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 I think, still a question mark in, in many people's minds. And I wonder if you have thoughts as to kind of new risks to supervisors, not only to you in Dubai, but also generally um, worldwide. And if you think there are new lines of defense that need to be built, is it technology, is it something else that, that regulators will need to be using more actively in order to detect um, these kind of new <laughs> and emerging yep. lurking risks? No, I, and those are, that's a very good question um, and a very good series of questions there. We could probably spend a half hour talking about this um, uh, alone. But um, uh, without question, I have to say that the operational resilience of the financial institutions around the world has been remarkable. Um, and that goes, I think, to, uh, I mean, the past five, 10 years of investments in technology um, that have paid off. Um, but at the same time, uh, I think remote working or work from home, however you want to, to, to call it, does bring a, a different uh, area of risk. Um, so the control environment cannot be the same um, uh, with people working from home um, uh, as opposed to sitting on a trading room floor um, uh, or in a, a sales office. Um, so that is a risk that, uh, that institutions are, are, are grappling with. Of how do you monitor um, the, the front line, uh, I guess, um, uh, in, in this particular environment? Uh, also, I think the cybersecurity element uh, is a critical um, piece that we all have to pay attention to right now that phishing attacks around the world have spiked um, over the year. Um, uh, and so that's an element that, uh, that really needs to be controlled. And uh, you've probably seen the DFSA now as a threat intelligence platform um, that, uh, that we're helping uh, link um, uh, firms in the center with, with the um, uh, cybersecurity experts in the UAE and around the world um, uh, to share information and to share threats. Um, uh, with each other. And I think that that was just started this year, but that's going very well um, uh, as, as well. Um, uh, and then you have to think of consistency of decisions. You know, when you're, when you're in a remote working environment, that uh, 
in an office environment, particularly in an open plan environment, which almost everybody has, um, uh, that when you had a question, it was very easy to roll back your chair and say, hey, um, you know, how, how have you dealt with this? Um, well, what, what happens if, you know, if we do this? Um, uh, where when you're working from home uh, or, or, or remote working in wherever you're from, um, where you have to then uh, um, uh, schedule a Zoom call, you may not do that. Um, you may just go ahead and say, well, I'll make the decision um, uh, anyway. And so uh, uh, that's a risk, I think, that uh, every firm uh, needs to deal with, including ours, um, uh, that we need to make sure that people are talking. Mm. No, absolutely. I think it's, it's a new environment that, um, that, that firms and regulators are, are having a, a tough time negotiating, in, in, navigating. And I think the cybersecurity risks are, are very interesting. The platform that you launched, I wasn't actually aware of, but it, I think it's a kind of perhaps uh, the front line of this new frontier of yes. risk that, that we are facing and that, you know, cybersecurity was talked about before uh, the COVID crisis, but I think as, as, as you point out, has gained a whole new um, uh, importance. Uh, but with that, uh, unfortunately, we promised to, to our audience to keep these interviews for, uh, for half an hour. And unfortunately, our half an hour today has, has run out. But um, I would like to thank you very much for, for sharing your insights on, on, on Dubai, but also on the, on the financial market uh, developments uh, globally. And we hope to continue these conversations with your colleagues. I think we have uh, perhaps um, Eric Solomon, who will be joining in future episodes to talk about more of the capital market landscape and, and, and governance development. So certainly something that uh, we, we, we would like to continue uh, going forward. Um, and thank you for, for sharing your thoughts um, on this episode today. It's my pleasure. I look forward to seeing you again. Thank you, Brian. And for our, for our um, global audience, just to, uh, a quick uh, message to, uh, to mention that this episode uh, will be available on our YouTube channel as all the other episodes uh, gratis. And we, we invite you to subscribe and share um, what we think is, um, is, is, is quite interesting governance content with your colleagues and uh, partners. And look forward to having you join on uh, future occasions. Mm -hmm.